please welcome for your presentation, Jack Cleffer. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. So uh, I started this business, Jack's Plastic Welding, uh, 35 years ago. Just so you know, uh, that uh, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Uh, so who was able to go snorkeling yesterday in this crowd? That's a fair number. Did anybody see any coral bleaching? Oh, there's a couple. I'd really like to talk to you guys after the show. Uh, basically, my experience on the reef yesterday was past my wildest dreams. I went snorkeling once in the Caribbean back in the 1980s before they knew anything about coral bleaching. And uh, this blew the doors off of the whole thing. My favorite was the giant clams. Did anybody see a giant clam? All right. I am just totally amazed by those creatures. I'd sat and watched the giant clam for half an hour. It didn't do much. <laughs> but, but that was, that was pretty cool. So we had a fantastic day yesterday. And uh, what this is, uh, is really about is, um, let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. What this presentation is really about is uh, when we talk about coral reefs, we get a lot of uh, gloom and doom scenarios. And, and I'm not going to try and downplay that at all because it's real. Uh, some people say that 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has vanished because of coral bleaching. And there's a number of reasons behind that, and we'll get into that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, last... Uh, Two days ago in Townsville, we were able to meet with some uh, coral biologists and we got a little bit more insight into what's happening in the, on the Great Barrier Reef and especially about the uh, Australian Institute for Marine Science and uh, how Sea Corps relates with those guys. So there's a lot of stuff that I could discuss here, but I probably need to stick to the script. So here we go. If I can make sure that I get my pointer working. There we go. Okay. Uh, my wife, Lori, had a saltwater aquarium for about 20 years. So she was really interested in, the, in what was happening yesterday. And in Townsville, they have the, the Ames Center has a, an aquarium there. So we went and visited that. It was wonderful. We got all kinds of news information. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background here. In 2002, the USGS contacted my business about doing uh, some projects for the coral bleaching that was happening there. Then, at, uh, then the California Academy of Sciences in 2008, we did a, a project on the Great Barrier Reef for ocean acidification. And then in 2017, at the end of 2017, Secor contacted us. We did the 1.0 in 2018, and this year we're working on 2.0. And so you might be, oh, wait a minute. Uh, really, it takes a, a village to raise a child, but it takes a world to save an ecosystem. So this is a big priority. I think we need to make this a world priority, and now I'm going to talk about my story a little bit. So, why is an inflatable designer telling you about coral reefs? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of background so that we can kind of get into that. Uh, this is not what we do. This is a inflatable, of course, but it's a, it's a jumpy castle. And uh, this is made with uh, coated fabric. It's only coated on one side, but it's sewn. So they have to blow the air into it, and it's got a constant air supply. That's not what we do. We weld fabric. And this is not what we do either. Oh, I'm sorry about the quality of that picture. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is the Viking approved version of this photo. Uh, <laughs> I can't do the X-rated one. So anyway, um, 
this particular product is uh, made with a film. It does not have a fabric inside, and the fabric's what gives the material strength. So this is a little bit more like it. Uh, so you can see here, my friend Hamish is running one of our boats. This boat is called the Humpback Chub, and it's really uh, a pontoon raft. We call them catarafts. And this is going through the biggest hole in uh, Lava Falls in the Grand Canyon. We have a couple of our other products on here. Our best product is this uh, self-inflating mattress pad that we make. It's called the Paco Pad. We sell more of those than anything else. There's a bunch of dry bags and other stuff on the back. The reason why the fabric is so important here is because if you go into this reversal and you have a floppy boat, it'll flip. And you don't want to flip because then all your gear gets scattered all over the river and a bunch of other stuff that, that's nasty. But anyway, this is the same boat that my daughter rode me down the Grand Canyon with when she was 19. And we pulled away from the, from the put-in. Took, she took two strokes and she said, Dad, you need to work on your passenger skills. And I don't have any. Because I was a guide down there and I didn't, I didn't really acquire any passenger skills. But anyway, you can see that I do have a, a fondness for the Grand Canyon. And I'll actually talk about that a little bit more. But here are a couple of products that uh, I want to show that have made a difference in some ways. Um, this one here is a device that uh, wraps around a, a unit called a rope ascender. And uh, commandos, particularly people like Navy SEALs, from countries like Indonesia and China and India and Vietnam, they use these devices to recapture ships that have been taken over by pirates. And uh, this, is, this actually provides neutral buoyancy for the rope ascender. So you throw the grappling hook up on top of the ship and you swim over to the boat and you hook this rope ascender around the, around the uh, rope and you zoom up the rope with your weapon ready and you, take, you retake the ship. That one is made with uh, urethane-coated nylon. This one over here, you can see we have a uh, UHMW sheet that these tubes are sitting on. There's a platform on top of it, and there's 100,000 pounds of gear on top of the platform. They're dragging this platform across the ice sheet from the northwest corner of Greenland to the summit, which is about 1,500 miles to the southeast. I don't know if they can do that anymore because there's huge cracks developing in that ice sheet because of global warming. But these pontoons are what we made, and uh, they are made out of urethane-coated polyester fabric. This product down here is a device that we put behind a semi-tractor trailer. It has a CO2 bottle right there. And the device is in a bag behind the, behind the cab, just in case it inflates by itself. So it's behind the cab, just hanging there. And you can open it up really fast, open the bag up really fast. You pull this out, you, you open the CO2 bottle, and it fills up in about three or four seconds. You set it underneath a leak that you may have underneath the fuel tank. So what that does is that captures all the fuel that you might have lost on the road. The funny thing about this is it costs about the same amount as the fuel that you're catching. However, the real cost is the EPA cleanup cost that you would have if you were to not use something like this. Uh, that, one was, that one is made with... Uh, polyester or PVC coated polyester fabric. This one down here is the most interesting engineering project. Well, not the most interesting engineering project, but one of them that we've done. And uh, this is by a company called Russell Tech in Canada. We have some rings that go around circumferentially around this axis here. And those rings are inflated to 15 PSI. 
They're made out of uh, PVC coated polyester fabric also. And Russell Tech hooks these little wheels on there. We make the little uh, disc diaphragm thing with the spokes. Back here you have an emitter and a collector and the emitter and the collector actually measure uh, the thickness of a pipe in a water main. So what you do is you, you deflate this thing, you t put it down a manhole cover, you reinflate it, and you drag it down a water main, and you can tell how thick the steel is in various places on the water main. So this has saved uh, cities like San Diego hundreds of millions of dollars because now they can tell you, they can tell when they have to replace this section of the water line instead of digging the whole thing up. So, a little closer to home. Um, we have uh, an animal in this part of the world, they call it a dugong. This animal is a manatee, and they're kind of similar animals. Uh, in this picture, they're rescuing uh, a manatee, they ended up calling him 3PO. Uh, he has a, uh, a fishing line wrapped around his fin. You can see it bleeding out there. And uh, it was getting pretty serious. They had to take him to the vet. And one of the problems with rescuing manatees and taking them to the vet is that they're n neutrally buoyant animals and they're not really made to be on a backboard. So what happens is the uh, animal would break his own ribs if he were put on a backboard. So we made this device... And uh, the, the white material down here is a, um, like, uh, paddleboard material, inflatable paddleboard material. And so it makes a, a nice flat cushion of air. There's a piece of plywood underneath that, and then there's this uh, inflatable ring around that so they can put water inside of this too. Underneath all of that is a piece of plywood that gives it support. And... Then wrapping the whole thing up is a, another really heavy-duty piece of uh, material, really thick, and it's got handles on it. There's probably 20 handles around this thing, and uh, the, all the people that are there to help will grab a hold of this, and they'll hoist the manatee up, and they'll put him in the back of a pickup truck, take him to the vet, and then they'll bring him back out and let him free again. So this has been a, kind of a wonderful thing. And it's kind of interesting that we have dugongs here and we have manatees over there. This device is the one that probably got us into the Sea Corps business in the first place. Uh, what this is, is this is an inflatable tank. This is a, a floating tank. The inflatable up here rests on top of the ocean and the tank is all of this part down here. They fill it up with seawater and they put a basic solution inside of it. Then they spread it out over one specific spot in the reef, and they've done this for three or four years. And they quantified what the cost of ocean acidification is. And really, what the cost of ocean acidification is, is about a 12% loss of growth in coral reefs. So what happens is CO2 in the atmosphere combines with the ocean water and, and makes carbolic acid and it is bringing the pH level down. So instead of being 8.2, it's now at about 8.1 and that's about a 30% increase in uh, acidification of the ocean. This is one I really want to talk about. This is the uh, Coral Kindergarten 1.0. And some of the interesting problems that we had to solve with this were uh, we had to have a, a tank that floated on top of the water. We have to have a, a tank that has windows in it. Now we can't rely on the weight of the water to keep the tank down. So we have to put a frame on the bottom of the, of the tank and tie it down to the, to the bottom of the ocean. So there's another framework underneath here. You can see the windows here. And they are a specific, they have a specific size of mesh on them that let the good guys in and keep the bad guys out. And in this picture, you see this PVC frame, and that's for a uh, canopy. The canopy is there because most of these, uh, most of the spawning events happen in the rainy season. So you can't let 
fresh water get on top in the tank because that's where all the coral larvae stay. If they get on top of the tank and there's fresh water there, well, they'll die because they have to have a certain amount of salinity. And what else you're seeing in here are baskets full of substrates, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Oh, another thing. On the bottom, there's a big zipper that you undo, and you let the sediment out, and you get up in there and clean it out. So there's a lot of technical issues with this. So humans need coral reefs. And... Uh, For all of the reasons above, and for one huge reason, which is that they're a vital part of the ecosystem that brings us 70% of our oxygen, and that's not even part of the equation. But the rest of the equation is that when you add it all up, it's about $375 billion, billion U.S. dollars, worth of benefit that coral reefs give us. And we've been getting it for free. So, for instance, 25% of all the fish species live in less than 1% of the ocean surface around coral reefs. Six million fishermen subsist on reef fishes. A healthy reef can produce 5 to 15 tons of fish products per square kilometer. And so if you add the 350,000 square miles of the Great Barrier Reef, and that's immense, it's huge, and you do the math... That could be 5% of the total consumption of the world's fish. So the world uh, eats about uh, 100 million tons of fish every year. So there are about one, 1 billion people in the world who rely on coral reefs for their livelihood one way or another. And uh, this is a picture I just added this morning. I want you to, to notice this little logo right in here. Citizens of the Great Barrier Reef. I didn't know about this until, until yesterday, until I looked this up this morning. <clears throat> so citizens of the Great Barrier Reef, our connected platform is powered by your actions, bringing together people, projects, organizations from across the reef and around the world. United, we all inspire collaboration and collective impact on a global scale from ditching single-use plastic to citizen science and world-leading research. Everyone has a part to play. And, you know, I couldn't say that better. You know, it's right there on the ship that we took. And it's great. I, I am learning so much. Medical research. Coral reefs seem to be the medicine chest of the 21st century. You are 300 to 400 times more likely to find new drugs in coral reefs than on dry land. They're, the um, reefs contain a, a more biodiversity than rainforest, some people think. And we have explored only about 1% of the ocean floor, and we know less about the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. Here's another thing that's really important is uh, storm sur surge protection. So coral reefs flatten out waves. And at the present time, coral reefs can grow faster than ocean levels can rise. If we do not protect coral reefs and they're gone, by the 21st century, wave action on our coast will be 2.4 times higher than they are now. So it doesn't take, you know, a calculator to figure out, you know, when, you th when you're talking about $375 billion just in the regular benefits, then you start talking about the disaster benefit. It's really worth our time to save coral reefs and use them as a protector for our shores. This is one of my favorites, back to the Grand Canyon. I am metrically challenged, so I'm going to use the, the value 4,000 feet of limestone in the Grand Canyon. This is all sequestered carbon, 
and it's set in stone. And limestone doesn't go away. You know, you can sequester carbon in, in rainforests, but what happens is if that, if that uh, wood gets burned or it decomposes, the carbon gets released again. But when it's sequestered in limestone, it's there forever. So this is a great way to sequester CO2. Now, uh, I probably ought to explain what sequestering is. It's the actual taking of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So if we do that, and we have healthy coral reefs, it is possible with the best possible scenario to remove 9% of what we produce now, 9% of the CO2 of what we produce now, it is possible to remove with carbon sequestration in coral reefs. Another reason to get them healthy. So now coral reefs need humans. And uh, coral reefs are struggling. And the main culprits are climate change, ocean acidification, plastic waste, pollution, and overfishing. It's time to pressure your governments into chipping in a little money to help solve the problem. And not just the Australian government, because they have the Great Barrier Reef. I think that all governments have a stake in this. So I'm going to do a brief little explanation about what coral bleaching is for those of you who, who don't really know what's going on. Uh, basically, coral is an animal, a mineral, and a plant at the same time. Coral polyps are the animal, and the, the plant inside of the coral polyp is an algae, and it's a symbiotic relationship. The algae will uh, produce glucose for the coral. The coral produces ammonia and fertilizer for the algae. Now, about 200 million year, 300 million years ago, this was invented by corals and algae, and that's why we have 4,000 feet of, of this stuff in the Grand Canyon. It happened in an area of the ocean that was basically infertile, and it makes a wonderful ecosystem where you've seen a lot of fish and a lot of wildlife. So it's a great system. Uh, oh, so what coral bleaching is then is uh, the heat from uh, climate change affects the algae and the algae starts producing uh, toxins and the corals will expel them. And they're not dead yet, but if they don't get a new algae in about two weeks, then they will starve to death because there's not enough food there for them. They do eat other things, but usually there's not enough food in, the, in, this, uh, in this environment for coral reefs to survive. Another Another problem is uh, the need to reduce trash. This is not a photoshopped image. Great surfing spot, though, if you can dodge the, the plastic. This could be the reality if we don't do something about uh, pl uh, plastic in our ocean. So single-use plastic, you keep, you keep hearing about that. My favorite project is one called the uh, the ocean cleanup project, where they have a great big boom that goes out in the ocean and is supposed to collect the, the plastic. They're having problems with it. There's a, an idea called the, the law of unintended consequences. They're still trying to figure out why it's not working properly, but it's, at least it's going in the right direction. And so I supported that project, and I hope that it works out for those guys. Oh, yeah, there's, a, there's a, um, a project that the United Nations does called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And what that is, what that has to do with is sustainable development for developing countries and the human resource. So if humans are able to have a more fulfilling life, and the developing countries have a better go of it, then they will, the, the people in those countries will start demanding better sanitation and better uh, 
waste management. And so, in 2018, it was the first year that there were more people on the earth that were considered middle class than they were considered poor. And we need to keep that going. We need to not be dumping sewage into our water. So, a good example of this is in front of our house in uh, Guayabitos, Mexico. We, in the late 80s, there was a uh, lagoon system for the sewage in the, uh, the town next door. And that broke and it, filled the, it uh, flooded the Haltemba Bay and killed all the corals. And they haven't come back yet. I'm hoping that some of these techniques will help us bring the corals back to Haltemba Bay. But what does, uh, what does sewage do? Well, one of the things it does is it over-fertilizes the, the area and you get situations like this where you have intense algae taking over. And the reason why this is a problem is because coral larvae can't find a place to live. They just, out, they just get out-competed. So another thing that's a problem with this is overfishing. So you, you catch all the fish and there's no fish eating the algae, there's no urchins eating the algae, and there's an imbalance in the ecosystem. So we need to have places where uh, fish can grow, and there's an idea called uh, fish spillover, I guess is what it's called, where they spill out of these no fishing zones and into the places where the impacts are a little harder from human fishing. So, um, let's see. The country of Mexico put 50,000 square, mi 50, square miles uh, into one of those no fish zones just to the west of Guayabitos. And uh, the countries of Chile, and I'm not going to say this right, I'm sure, the little teeny island country of Nayui, I think is how it's pronounced. They did three of these, and altogether, those are twice the size of Germany, and that's in the South Pacific. So, uh, those are really cool things, and there's more of those. And, of course, on the Great Barrier Reef, if you, if you read any of the stuff about the Eye of the Reef uh, app, then you would quickly come to the realization that there's a lot of those no-fish zones on the reef. So it's, it's a, a big idea, and it's important. Climate change is one of the things that we can all deal, that we can all help with. The ocean absorbs 90% of the heat produced by the greenhouse effect. And of course, CO2 makes the oceans more acidic. The last five years were the hottest five years on record, and this should be a wake-up call for everybody. Greenhouse gases like methane and CO2 are a leading cause. So I'm going to talk about methane just a little bit because that's the, that's the um, main component of natural gas. And so we talk a lot about ecology and using natural gas rather than coal as a bridge fuel to bridge from fossil fuels to renewables. We need to make sure that those things are covered and re recovered in a responsible manner. We can't leak methane into the atmosphere because if you do, it's like 38 times more potent than CO2 and it doesn't have a, a way to get pumped down through sequestration. It stays around a lot longer. So, I promised I would talk about sex, so coral sex is only exciting if you're a coral. But <laughs> there are other ways that corals reproduce, like fragmentation and cloning themselves. And here we have a picture of, of a broadcast sp spawner. They throw out large amounts of sperm and eggs, and you hope that they will combine somewhere in the ocean. They actually have about a one in a million chance. 
in that vast area. So one of the ideas is to, is to gather this all up and get it closer together so that it'll work. Uh, that's on a healthy reef. <clears throat> on a reef where you have 50% of the, of the uh, reef is dead, then it, you've got a real problem. So there are a couple ways that humans can help with this, and that is to uh, use techniques that get the sperm and the eggs back together. We can use uh, uh, hybridization techniques to enhance the, the genetic uh, code and, uh, of, of the particular species we're working with, or species. Uh, oh, and microfragmentation. But whatever they are, wh whatever uh, technique we use, we want to get really strong genetic codes because to do all of this work and then just to have it bleach again is not helping the situation. So we go out looking for survivors. And... This is a little bit of a problem on the Great Barrier Reef. You have to have a very special dispensation to actually go out and collect survivors because you can't collect anything off the reef. And so we're looking at those, the, especially the Sea Corps people are looking at those kinds of issues with, in with the Ames people. And uh, they're working on getting special dispensation so they can collect the survivors off the reef. And one of the things that we learned when we talked to these guys was, so you might think, well, why don't you just take some of the corals from the very hottest part of the reef and put them in the very coldest part of the reef? And it's interesting because the opposite effect takes place. It's too cold and they still die. So you have to have something that works in between. So we can have species that go across the whole spectrum of the reef, but they're going to have the same, the same problem with cold as they do with hot. Um, okay, here's an important point that I want to make. If this was a normal situation where climate change wasn't happening so fast, then in 30 or 50 years, those survivors would take over the reef and you'd have great genetic code for that reef. What's happening, though, is that these... Uh, bleaching events are happening faster and faster. The ocean is warming up too fast. And we can't even get the corals to the point where they're fully established before the next bleaching event happens. And that's one of the big problems. So that's why they're talking about enhancing evolution with sexual reproduction. Here's another technique that they use and this is pretty widely used. This is called microfragmentation. They take coral samples. This, this works with any coral in the uh, Caribbean, and I'm not, I'm not sure about the Great Barrier Reef because the Caribbean has 60 different species, and the Great Barrier Reef has something like 250. So uh, this is the place where it's really happening, by the way, because of that kind of thing. But anyway, you cut them up into little pieces. You put them on a little biscuit and you start growing them, and then they start growing together, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and uh, pretty soon, you have a coral that's the same size as it was if it was 25 years old. And because when you microfragment them, they start growing at 25 to 50 times faster than they would have normally. I think this is a, uh, a natural process that happens when you have things like hurricanes to roll through. Corals break apart, they fall to the bottom of the ocean, they start growing really fast because they just had an incident. This is kind of like the same thing with, uh, with uh, forests where you have seeds that don't pop open until there's a forest fire. Kind of the same idea there. Okay, 
Uh, we're going to watch a short video about CCOR here. There we go. Coral reefs are the largest structures built on Earth and are formed by the corals themselves. They are the most diverse ecosystems in our oceans and provide homes for countless animals, including commercial fish species. Many people's lives depend on healthy coral reefs. Corals are tiny animals that live together in colonies of thousands of individuals. Like all animals, corals need to grow and reproduce. When conditions are poor, corals stop their reproduction. Some of them may still spawn, but cannot produce offspring. Around the globe, coral reefs are on the decline because of human impacts such as pollution, overfishing, and climate change. Coral reefs need our help to recover and flourish again. Seacor International is working to help sustain coral reefs. Most coral species spawn only once a year around full moon. In mass spawning events, coral colonies simultaneously release eggs and sperm. These gametes drift to the water surface where they might fertilize. During night dives, our team collects the coral gametes with special nets and immediately brings them ashore. We fertilize the gametes in the laboratory and culture the resulting larvae. After a few days, these free-swimming larvae choose a place to settle and metamorphose into a new coral. The tiny corals require the right conditions to grow and survive. At present, each young coral is still transplanted by hand to restore a coral reef. This is time-consuming, expensive, and limited in scale. We need new approaches to restore reefs at a more meaningful scale. Seacor has developed settlement substrates for coral larvae that self-attach to the reef. They can be produced en masse at low cost. By working with corals' sexual reproduction, we are able to culture millions of larvae with low-tech approaches. Seacor is currently conducting pilot projects for large-scale restoration. One day, we may be able to sow corals onto the reef in huge numbers, aiming at restoring what is currently being lost. give coral reefs a future. Support Seacor International. <clears throat> okay, well, one of the interesting things about that video is that they were doing the, they were, at, they were putting the eggs and the sperm together in the uh, laboratory. And that works in Australia really well because they have these, this huge infrastructure and the, the reefs are so far away and they're so immense. They can't just, in, uh, in Australia, they can't just drive across the reef and throw them out of the boat. Uh, they're working on that issue. I wanted to point out that uh, there was a part of the video where they had these crates of substrates down on the bottom of the ocean too. And what they were doing is they were putting a they were allowing the substrate to get a biofilm on them. Now, 
this particular shot shows the substrates hanging in the crates inside of the tank. You can, you can see the, the mesh window here. In 2.0, we're going to have a double mesh window. So they can clean the windows out without actually opening up, opening up the, uh, the tank to uh, uh, the bad uh, things on the outside. Anyway, so it's, it's, it's a double mesh window. And uh, the tank, the, the tube is going to be a little bit larger too. Anyway, this kind of shows you how that works. Oh, um, it's uh, not to worry. We have plenty of places where this kind of a system will work. And uh, those places are all over the Caribbean and all over the islands of the South Pacific. It's just that Australia has such a great infrastructure to deal with this through their own laboratories and stuff, that they're doing this on a lab basis here in Australia. So this particular slide shows the biofilm on the substrate. And I want to point out the shape of the substrate. And it's just made with cement, which is limestone, right? It's crunched up limestone. So it's just a natural thing. But they allow it to sit in the, in the ocean for oh, sometimes up to two months to get this coloration on it. And uh, Lori informs me that that's what they call live rock. So uh, these colors are the, the uh, kind of algaes that form on the substrates that the, that the larvas really love to attach to. They don't want to attach to PVC or anything like that. So they're looking for this, and that's why they can put so many of them in the tank. So there are some successes that we'd like to talk about, and one of them is the Barrier Reef of Belize. It was put on the World Heritage Site in 1996, the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1996. In 2009, it was put on the World Heritage Endangered Site list. And last year, it was taken off. And that's because the country of Belize, or the people of Belize in particular, decided that their reefs were too important for their economy. And this is also called the Barrier Reef of Belize. So Laughing Bird Key is a place where the coral reefs were, were reestablished almost 100% with human intervention. So it works. So what can one person do? You can support ecotourism. You can learn how to plant corals in your favorite dive spot, and the guides will be there to help you. Uh, tourism helps drive the value of money towards the ecosystem. You can get political. Write your representatives. Ask for better cooperation on reef management between governments so they can share and strengthen coral genotypes. Ask for more renewable energy systems. Get outraged when sewage gets dumped into the ocean. And support sustainable development for developing countries. You know, we all do better if we all do better. That's the idea. We must reduce the amount of greenhouse gas and cool the planet. It's time to think globally and act locally. So the term that we're using here is glocal. And I want to point out what this little device is here. This is what we call a Samboni. This is in uh, Guayabitos, Mexico. And it drives down the beach every morning and picks up trash. But there's Canadians out there picking up trash. There's Mexicans in big long lines picking up trash. They are really serious about their beach. And it's never been cleaner. I have the best hope for humanity by, just by watching the beach in Mexico. It's really great. So the choice is yours. Nature gave us great coral reefs. 
And this could be our future, building concrete wave barriers to keep the storm surges out, and they don't do much for us. But they cost a lot of money, and we get all of this for free right now. It's a grim future for our grandchildren. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest structure on Earth made by a living organism. It's visible from space. It gives us so much. It gives us food, recreation, quality of life, a beautiful thing to look at. I am so grateful that we saw this wonderful reef yesterday. And, of course, this is the scenario that we want to keep. So it's not that we are on our way to destroying the world. We have actually been doing that for quite a while now. It is that we are beginning to wake up as from a millennium long sleep to a whole new relationship to our world, ourselves, and each other. So I would like to invite anybody who's interested to get with me and I can uh, get them a list of, of the materials that I use to, to do this presentation if they like or we can have a great discussion about this. Thank you very much for listening.